Well, I am super excited about being here and about showing you what, uh, what you're about to see. Uh, we've been working on this for quite a while, and we believe that this is going to be disrupting the industry. Uh, the drive to improve safety and productivity of mining has been driving the adoption of automation and digitization. The front of the mine has long been heavily transformed. It's full of autonomous trucks and shovels. They're being remotely controlled from the other side of the world. The back of the mine is also heavily automated. There's lots of autonomous trains and connected ports. But what about the middle part of the plant? This is the biggest section where most of the vital machinery is. And also, there's hundreds of people walking around, so the potential to unlock here is near limitless. So why is it still not done then? Well, the reason why it's not done, because this is some of the most difficult parts to digitize in a conventional way. Running cables never seems to be a cost-effective option here. Uh, and to set up a Wi-Fi network here is challenging, to say the least. I mean, most of the area looks like uh, steel and concrete superstructures that are designed to house electric motors and pumps that produce an immense amount of electromagnetic noise. On top of that, these are very hard to reach uh, locations. And uh, to get a Wi-Fi expert on site in the middle of nowhere is challenging <laughs> in the best of times. But what if I told you that there is a better way? So instead of considering a network in a traditional topology where you have an access point trying to beam and communicate to devices hundreds of meters away, what if we could break it down into a mesh topology? And then each individual node will only need to service the area around itself and then retransmit the data onto its neighbor. The disadvantage of that, obviously this is a much better topology, but the disadvantage of that, you need a lot of nodes. Well, you see, lighting actually positions the best device for, this, for such nodes. Lights are elevated. They're permanently powered, and they're located everywhere throughout the site. Well, at least everywhere people need to get to, right? And the best thing about it, lights are routinely maintained. Meet Coulon DLK. This light has withstand the test of time. Uh, it, the reason why I chose this one, because there's thousands of them. If you walk out onto any and average mine site, you will see hundreds to thousands of DLKs scattering throughout the site. So we've built a new generation with a uh, smart connected node. So basically, it's a networking node inside the light. And pretty much all the lights from the last year have had the networking nodes in them. So what we then did is we actually uh, set up a network in a way. It's a quite ingenious uh, work of our engineers that connects the network in a way that join the network automatically. And this is probably the key, because there is no networking engineers on site, so no one's going to be crawling around connecting networks. So as soon as the light uh, sees another light within a 30-meter radius, they join together and form a cluster. And then eventually the cluster grows and forms a network. But then initially we wanted to do this, uh, just like any other lighting company, to do the lighting stuff, to dim the lights up and down, to turn the lights on and off, to inspect the lights, to do the automatic emergency lighting inspection, and so on. But once we actually deployed it, we realized that um, the platform that we're using is actually quite ingenious. And that platform hosts a lot of really innovative solutions. So instead of doing the conventional way and just locking ourselves up to that platform on our own, we actually opened up to everyone else who's using the same technology. You can think of it like an app store for applications, right, for IoT services. Imagine if you could do an integrated asset tracking by slapping a node like this onto any device around, or any crate or box or anything that you're trying to find around the site, and then uh, lights will basically show you uh, wherever the, the node is. So it's basically an integrated asset tracking at virtually no cost. It's a $50 node. What if you could do uh, personnel tracking? What if you could locate people anywhere on site, including underground, uh, across buildings, including multiple levels, and in areas where there's no radio reception? Because lights penetrate into this area and they'll form the network inside. With that, what if you could do an instant roll call? In case of emergency, typically in evacuation, there's about 10 or 15 minutes when people start to exit and you have absolutely no idea if anyone's safe or not. What if you could actually track exactly what happened and exactly who is where? Other service providers are offering um, machine condition monitoring. 
What if you could analyze vibration and rotation of any rotating machinery and predict failures before they even happen? So there are some companies offering that service as well. They operate on the same platform. The innovations don't stop there. This is a smart bolt uh, being developed. And uh, you could basically predict the wear of the lining of the bin. And instead of replacing everything at once, you could replace the bits that only need to be replaced. Again, that's not that different to machine condition monitoring, just a different application. Then there's temperature in environmental sensors. Again, device is not too different to this. It costs about 50 bucks. And you could just slap it on anywhere around the uh, location, anywhere around the fixed plant. And you can get a real-time uh, readings of the temperature, humidity, air quality, noise, lighting. Right? You can do all of these measurements at virtually no cost. Then you could start to improvise and kind of start to create customized solutions for your particular needs. Right? You could actually, uh, one of the applications we've come across is the lockout tags. Right? So people constantly forget to lock out. They constantly, every time you drive out from site, there's big signs, don't forget to lock out. Did you forget to lock out? Somebody forgets to lock out, then they have to come back and unlock. What if you could do an asset tracking node similar to this? One on the lock, one on the person, and one on the board. If the person is leaving the boundary of the site and the lock is not back on the board, you forgot to lock out. You can issue an alert. You have lots of specialist tools on sites, quite expensive tools, and they're quite rare, and a lot of them require calibration and shouldn't be exposed to harsh conditions. What if you could slap a node like this, which is a temperature uh, node and a location node in, in one? Uh, basically, if the tool gets left in the sun uh, for a long time, you could locate the tool and re retrieve it. Again, very inexpensive uh, implementation. Then there are ecosystem partners that are offering uh, all sorts of sensors, all sorts of industrial sensors as well. You have a pressure sensor, temperature sensor, level sensor for any liquid. So if you have a diesel tank, if you have water tanks, you can just drop a sensor there without having to run the wiring, without having to connect things together. So our ecosystem partner network is growing very rapidly. Like I said, this is a fairly new technology, but because it's so robust and so reliable uh, and so innovative, there's new technologies popping out all the time. And we're basically adding them on into our net network. The best thing about it is that the network deploys by itself. You literally have nothing to do with this. All you have to do is buy cool on lights. With every light you buy, the network cluster grows and grows, and you don't even have to deploy it, because you'll only deploy it when you start actually deploying the network. But by that stage, you will have the infrastructure deployed. I wanted to talk about digital transformation. It's a really, really hot topic, and just about any conference where you go to, people are talking about digital transformation and digitization of sites. But I think the common misconception is digital transformation is not a project. It's a journey. The reason why it's a journey is because it's based on technology, and technology evolves. So let's say right now you have a site where you're monitoring a few things here and there, as you do, right? And as technology evolves, uh, monitoring becomes cheaper. And as we're just, Greg, just talking about data acquisition, you can acquire more and more data at relatively low cost. So you start monitoring a bit more data, and then it becomes even cheaper and more convenient, and there's more sensors, and you start monitoring more data. And then it becomes even cheaper, and you're monitoring even more data. Now, when you get to this level, it takes a way out of scope of your uh, wireless network. This is the kind of network we're bound to create. We're saying we're not trying to uh, eliminate Wi-Fi networks. We're thinking that Wi-Fi network is critical and keep it for mission critical stuff. You should invest into that network and let Cisco or companies like that do that. The analogy I often use is kind of like in a five-star hotel. You walk in and you go into a shiny elevator that whisks you really uh, straight up at high speed into your room. What you don't see inside this elevator is dirty laundry, dirty dishes. You don't see any of the stuff and bags. That's because there is a service elevator at the back. Big and heavy elevator that moves really slowly and stops at every floor. That's the network we're trying to create. Think of it like a sensory backbone. The sensory backbone that will deploy uh, all around the site and will penetrate everywhere lights go and will service all of this stuff, and will basically be completely elastic and completely stretchable. The implementation of a network actually allowed us to create products that have never even been seen before. So we tackled an application of having visual uh, signaling. And we've created a product that can provide visual signals all across the site. It can provide you visual signals for lightning. Not only the product itself blinks, but because there's a radio network deployed, every light 
within the vicinity can actually replicate that. So you don't have to have it within the visual distance of the light. You can actually look up to the nearest light around you, and you'll get the visual signaling. Then we created, we tackled other challenges that we had over the years. For example, some sites require amber lighting for environmental reasons. But white lighting is better for people. But now that we have wireless network, we can actually set up a light that changes together with white for people and keeping the whole site for amber for environmental. Another thing that we could do is we could deploy lights and create every light as an emergency. So you no longer have to worry about two different designs. I have to worry about how to deploy things because the network is connected, right? This is something that couldn't be done before because the wiring wouldn't allow it. But now we no longer have to rely on the wiring. We no longer have to rely on uh, UPS systems or other emergency back systems because this is all taken care of. In other innovations, imagine if you could have a, a tracking tag that's not in a tag. If I asked you how many of you are wearing, would, would be willing to wear a sensors on you, most people would probably cringe and go, I'm not wearing sensors. Can I have a sea of hands? How many people are having a smartwatch right now? Including me. <laughs> You're wearing sensors on you. In fact, these sensors are measuring stuff that's vitals within you. What if I told you that we can make a watch that beacons around and pumps the vitals through the lightning network onto the control center? So now we're taking safety monitoring to the next level. Not only we're monitoring where people are, we're also seeing what is happening with them in real time. We set a challenge for us last year. I love my job. I get to travel all around the world, promise people all sorts of wild stuff. <laughs> my colleague Ben and I actually did a presentation right here on this stage in 2018, and we promised people wild stuff. But then we went back to the board and we actually delivered. So last year, we made a promise to do, create a watch like this, and we actually did. I don't have time for a demonstration here, but if you're willing to come up, you can actually see my vitals in real time and my colleagues. <laughs> now, I was talking about technological disruptions today. So the reason why this is happening is called convergence of technologies. And convergence of technologies is evolved in parallel at the same time. And they reach a certain point at which the critical mass is reached and a certain product can be created that disrupts the industry. I'll give you an example. In 2007, Steve Jobs launched an iPhone with the words, every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything. Boy, was he not wrong. That product did change everything. But Steve could not claim all the credit for it. I mean, this happened, the reason why this happened in 2007 and not in 2003 or 2004, because certain technologies had to catch up. The technology for screen, the technology for multi-touch, technology for battery, technology for radio communication. And then it took Steve Jobs and a talented team of Apple to put it all together into a product like an iPhone in 2007. Now, even in 2007, when he launched an iPhone, he launched it for three applications. He literally said it is a music player, a phone, and an internet communicator. Back then, he did not say it was going to be thousands of devices, tens of thousands of devices, but it was clear. But back then, you could see three applications. Similarly to today, we see very few applications, but we can see that there's a potential for expansion. Now, typically, when disruptions happen, they happen very quickly. And they happen, this is a really good example. <laughs> this is a printout from a magazine in 2007, right before the iPhone was launched, saying Nokia is the king of the world, can anyone overtake them? I want you to pay attention that the overtaken has happened by a company that has never released a phone. And that happens in technological disruptions all the time. Now, Uber has revolutionized a transport industry without owning a single car. Like Netflix revolutionized television without having a single TV station. This happens all the time. Amazon has taken over retail without having a single store because retail was all about location and stores. <clears throat> so when they happen, they happen really fast. And it's not like we didn't have these things before. It's not like we didn't have a calculator before. It's not like we didn't have a level measurer before. We did. So they didn't create anything new. What they did is they made it convenient. They made it very easy to deploy. I don't have to ha carry all these things with me. They're in my pocket. They're in my phone. This is why the disruption happened. So what we're saying here is you could deploy a completely elastic network that scatters throughout the entire site 
that can carry data for all of these new IoT services that are coming up on the market and get integrated with no effort. You're literally putting in no effort. You don't have to talk to your planning committee. You don't have to discuss anything because all you're doing is what you're already doing. You're replacing lights. And with every light, you're getting closer and closer to building a brilliant connected site of the future. Now, this brings me to the original point. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that we're on the verge of technological disruption, and I believe that lighting is the best conduit for it. Thank you.